Mm, hello all, uh, welcome to this third session of the training on vehicle targets cascading to size the, the battery. Uh, in this session, we will focus on the energy requirements. If we recall the scheme of this for training program, we started with setting the vehicle targets at the vehicle level. Second training was how to take those targets and define the battery power requirements. And this third training is to how to take the vehicle targets and size the, vehicle, the battery energy requirements. So these trainings are mostly focused on defining what the vehicle will demand from the battery, not so specifically in the battery technology, mostly to uh, select the right battery to the right uh, application. Uh, today is the last day of the active uh, training and we will have a follow-up session next week, the 25th of, of May, that will uh, have further question answer. Uh, yesterday we have very few time for question answer and we received some questions for email. So in case we cannot answer them today, uh, we will have time in the day 25 to answer them. So I also encourage you to send additional questions by, by email. And also this day will be the day in which the startups, uh, you will have the opportunity to present uh, your results in the, in the handover template that we will deliver. I will show you a little bit um, how is this template. We will share it after today's session. But uh, it is a template that uh, has all the points that we aim, that if you do this work for your for your specific activity, you you will need to cover. So mostly we took from the slides the the parts that need to be worked. So for example, uh, regarding facing one, first you will uh, have to describe the use case and what that uh, use case and business model will demand to the vehicle in terms of slopes, uh, distance, uh, type of cycle. Then we ask you to find uh, some competitors and do a picture of how they, 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 they size the vehicle, to what purpose, because this is a very good reference. And then, well, all, all, everything that we discussed yesterday, the, the forces, the resistance forces, the list of targets, the calculated force. So all the parts that need to be calculated that are not so much training, more like a handout, are here for you to, to follow up and do the same type of calculations, but for your own case. So these calculations, uh, you will have the opportunity to share them in the follow-up session uh, next week. And I really encourage you to share them even though you did not finish or you have some doubts or you got stuck in some points, because it's a very good opportunity to also receive feedback from other startups that might have been stuck and the same, at the same point and can share how they saw that bottleneck and also for from us. So, the ones that present, of course, will receive more feedback and more active feedback on how to follow up. So I think it is a really good opportunity, even though you don't have the time or the capability to have it completely finished for, for next week. Okay, so let's dive in in today's uh, training. Uh, at the starting point, I will also take the opportunity to explain a little bit more what we do in our team and why we develop this type of, of experience. So as we mentioned previously, we, we are now in the concept uh, phase in which we make quite simple simulations that show how the different systems interact. And these are useful for taking decisions, sizing the components, knowing the performance of, at the vehicle level. So these are not detailed simulations. These are the global or combined architecture simulations. And we will not share the details of all the projects that we did, but just to let you understand that all these that we share come from a big list of projects. So for example, we have applied this calculation process 
five prototypes, electric prototypes that were built our, at our company as our R&D activities. We started at 2009 with a, with a light duty vehicle, with a light duty truck. Uh, we did a small, mo a small mobility vehicle, a uh, um, supercar, a race car of uh, 1,000 uh, horsepower, uh, SUV that was 4x4 with independent motors and other sub um, pickup with also independent motors. So these were opportunities for us to test to, to validate our process and, and to learn about how to estimate data, uh, what can we find in the market, and also to play with different architectures. We also work in many other projects with clients. For example, here we have an electric minibus that we developed to run two shifts without the need of recharging in the specific Barcelona use case. So each case is different. There is the regulation, but in this case, they wanted to size it not to the regulation cycles, but for their cycle. And their cycle was 16 hours, uh, no stop for recharge. And they wanted warranty that the vehicle complied with the road. Also, when it was fully charged with people, with the, and at the worst uh, summertime when the comfort is at full power, and that was the challenge. So it was defined to that specific use case, not to the 16 hours in the regulation cycle. Uh, some others, for example, we also participated in the quadricycle development of the Citroen AMI. We are also collaborating with startups at the US to develop uh, autonomous vehicles that also have a very specific uh, use case because the autonomous uh, functions consume a lot of power. So this is a very specific use case. We also work with refuse collecting uh, companies to hybridize sometimes uh, the complete vehicle, some other times just the refuse collecting part so that uh, they make less noise at the night when they are working. And we also worked to make a full electric quad. We also worked to design a delivery truck in, in Brazil also to, to size a full electric um, tractor in India. So, okay, many projects. So a little bit, this, uh, all this training uh, collapses or puts together all the know-how that we acquire from, from that experience. Okay. So this training will be organized mostly in five big uh, knowledge uh, groups. Uh, the first one is how to pre-process the user cycles. Uh, as you see, so in the previous slides, you might imagine that all these cases are usually very out of regulation. For example, race car. If you size the race car to the regulation cycle, you are not complying with its target use case that it's making races. So mo most of this, the user cycle and the final use have even more weight in the design and decision-making process than the regulation cycle that, of course, needs to be calculated. So yeah, it is important for your cases to, to also think about your users and how are they going to use the vehicles. So first part would be how to pre-process the user cycles so that they have enough quality to be used for the sizing. Second part, uh, calculate the detective power demands at the wheel from this user cycle, and this will be a similar process from that, that we did yesterday. Then, to move from the wheel demand to the electric demand, uh, next step, from this electric demand, dimension the battery, know which uh, size we need to calculate the battery, and then an additional section, uh, in section 4 we will be able to do all the calculation, but finally, in the fifth section, we will give you some hints of how you can validate that your calculation was correct and you did not make any mistake in the, in the process. So we'll give some hints. And then finally, references and uh, handout work that we will share. Okay. So starting with the pre-processing of the user cycles, 
I think DDAC also encourages you in sizing one to uh, record uh, the real use cycles. So if you don't have the possibility to record, uh, there are regulation cycles that are defined for different types of quadricycles that are the double MTC cycles that are low speed cycles. And you can take some of these. So as you see, the speed profile is quite the speed profile you can expect in the city. In the regulation, there are different double MTC cycles, the one, the two, and three. So depending on your type of vehicle, from a regulation point of view, you will have to uh, size or declare the range on one of, one of the cycles. But from user point of view, you can also decide which one is more similar to your use case. That for quadricycles. For small mobility like scooters or bicycles, um, you, I, I think you can also take these cycles and check which ones do you think the speed profile is your, more similar to your case and, and take those uh, for calculation. So this is, let's say, the solution if you cannot measure. But we really encourage you to measure. So you can do maybe both or just measure, but we really encourage you to measure one of the cycles. So of course, there are from very expensive data acquisition uh, programs or very complete data acquisition programs to more um, handmade, let's say, uh, data acquisition. In, and in the middle, you can have all the, all the range of details and so on. So if you want to carry out a specific data acquisition program, you can, for example, contact us because IDIADA, for example, records 15 million of kilometers every year of acquisitions all over the world to different clients. So if you need professional support to make these recordings, you can count of us on us. Otherwise, if you don't have that opportunity, you can record them by yourself. There are a lot of applications, uh, bicycling applications, vehicle applications that you can download. You do the route with your vehicle or a similar vehicle, even though it is ICE combustion vehicle. The important part is that it is similar. You do the route and you can measure the instantaneous speed. And uh, you have to check that it is an application that also records the, the elevation. For this case, as we are only interested in speed and elevation, probably it is not needed a such big campaign of acquisitions that usually focus on, on more signals. So probably with this is enough. Okay. So once you have this cycle, we cannot directly take the cycle and start calculating. And why? Uh, because on this type of acquisitions, even in very big acquisition programs, we also have this type of problems, need to be solved before calculating. So you see here a speed signal, and if you look at it, it does not seem so bad. Like, OK, there is a little bit noise here. It's not big. Nothing happens. But if you check the formula that we saw yesterday of the force at wheel, it has a component that it is the acceleration. And acceleration is the derivative of this speed. So if you take this signal and you calculate acceleration, the signal that you get is this black one, that it is extremely noisy and ranges to very high plus value to a very high negative value. And probably these values are even out of the motor maximum torque. And these values makes you, if you really follow this, it means that here you have to accelerate a lot and then decelerate a lot and accelerate a lot. So that really does not happen. You are not performing very aggressive accelerations and breakings. This is just a signal communication error. So this needs to be solved prior using this for simulating, because if not, the simulation will do this aggressive accelerations and accelerations and the energy will be completely wrong. And if you don't do it, it can increase the energy consumption up to 30%, something more or less. So it is important to do this 
filtering and not just take the acquisition straightforward. Okay, so in the following slides, we will show you different types of problems. You saw that there are many, many we have many projects. Some of them, the acquisition was done by, by us, some other times by third parties, by other companies, by, by universities. So we are used to receive many kinds of data. So we have a very wide catalog of possible errors. And I think this catalog uh, of possible errors. It is not so beautiful to see, but I think it will help you as problem solving tips when you find your own errors. Mostly each acquisition is different, but I think that you see a lot of typical errors. You will have a toolkit to solve different types of them. Okay, so one possible error in SPID is to have discrete values. So you see the raw data that it is the red is not smooth. It is it has a constant value, then it changes, then it changes. So it has like steps of constant values. Why this happens? In this case, for example, uh, I think that the problem is that the measurement device rounds the value to entire figures. So it does not. It cannot provide the number 4.1, it can provide the number 4, 5, 6. So it is at 5 and then 7 and then 3, but it does not use all the decimal numbers in the middle. They will call it like this, rounded. So if you calculate the acceleration of this red cycle, what happens is that here there is no, 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 no acceleration, huge. A huge down and huge up, no, no, huge acceleration, no, no, huge acceleration. So that will impact also the acceleration profile and all the energy calculations. These small steps do not happen like this. Probably you accelerate at constant acceleration, but if you calculate this signal, is high, nothing, high, nothing, high. So that cannot be used for acceleration. Other possibility other reasons why you get this type of square signals it is uh, can be because uh, subsampling or oversampling so that the measurement device measures at one hertz and then it reports at 10 hertz so all the data that it does not have between maybe then one sample and the other, what it does is to repeat data so that it is also an option. And other times that this type of square signals happens is speed measurement devices that count the wheel turns. So there are some devices that we, um, are in an axis and count how much time does that axis take to take one turn. So the wheel is turning, and in every turn, they report a value. And while it is doing all the other turn, they keep reporting the same value. So there are few reasons to encounter these square signals, but in any way, we don't want these square signals. So possible solutions are, these square signals are a little bit difficult to solve, but depending on the source, there are different solutions. First one, is to apply a Fourier filter. So remove all the frequencies that are below some values. And the problem, so you see here a Fourier filter and it looks quite good. You see, okay, I, I can drive like this. But the problem of Fourier filters is that when you have constant speed, they create fake oscillations. So you have to check on this. Usually at, when you are driving, it is not a problem. The main problem is when the vehicle is stopped, because instead of being at zero kilometers per hour, they create oscillations around zero. So maybe you have to make some code that when it is stopped, you no longer use the Fourier filter, you just put zero and that's it. And another simple but quite good uh, measure is to apply the average mean. So the moving the moving average of the of the data and that it's more simple than the Fourier filter and in some cases works even better and you can do it in the Excel for example you can 
instead of having here the data of each second, you can make a, a calculation with three seconds forward and the average of three seconds forward and three seconds back. So you can try this. And another tip or idea would be to do over under sampling. So reduce the sample. So maybe take one data every 10 data or every five data and forget about the others. And this is why you also smooth. Okay. Uh, other, this toolkit, this possible solutions, also apply to the case of noisy signals. Here, the signal is like more smooth, but it has some peaks that probably are unrealistic. And when you don't know if a peak is realistic or not, you can have a look at it. Here, it breaks, it accelerates, and it breaks. And probably if you zoom in, that's three seconds. Do you really have time when you are driving in three seconds to be present the acceleration pedal, then the brake pedal, and then the acceleration pedal again? If the answer is no, is that it is unrealistic because the driver did not have time to do that. And what you are seeing here is a, a noise of the signal that needs to be post processed. So for this case, you could apply the same toolkit that we said before. Okay. And another case is that if you have different ways to measure the speed, for example, GPS and also the CAN uh, communication of the vehicle or OBD communication of the vehicle or any other speed communication of the vehicle, usually the one that comes from the vehicle is deviated from the one from the, from the GPS. And why is this? because every speed that it is calculated by the vehicle, the vehicle, what it is measuring is RPMs, revolutions of an axis, and it estimates the wheel radius, and with that calculates the speed. So the wheel radius estimation is not perfect, and all these vehicle speed calculations are up to plus minus 4% deviated from the real speed. But, these signals usually have more quality or many times have more quality than the others. So imagine that you have a square signal from the GPS and a very nice smooth signal from the vehicle that you know that it is deviated. So in that case, what I would do is to calculate this deviation ratio, this um, constant or proportional deviation ratio, that this is a factor that multiplies the speed, and then multiply the good signal from the vehicle calculation, can OBD or whatever, but by this coefficient. And then you get it to have the absolute value of the GPS, but to be more smooth and with higher quality. So that could be a solution. Then uh, unexpected peaks. So here we saw small peaks that can be considered noise. And these ones that I don't know how to call them, but maybe signal loss or oh, huge, unrealistic, very unrealistic peaks. When this happens, or here, for example, or sometimes even you lose the signal. When this happens, you cannot apply the average mean, neither the Fourier filter, because at the end, they consider every point. If so if the average does the average of this, it will go up here because these points move much higher than the others and they move the average up. So these are not noise, these are point, points that should not be considered at all by the to, to the average. So this usually require a more manual fixing or specific codes, but you have to do is to remove these points to completely remove them and in the middle interpolate. Also, sometimes also happens that the signal is lost and in the middle you have three seconds, you are, for example, here, and then you have four seconds of zero speed and then it continues. It is impossible that the vehicle break to zero and then in one second it accelerated to the same speed it was having before. So you should also delete them and join the points. So that could be a, a solution to this problem. And then other type of problem that happens uh, 
both with EPS and vehicle-based acquisition devices is that they don't record when the vehicle is stopped. Some GPS do not record when the speed is zero, they do not create a record data, and some vehicle-based measurements, when you do key off, they don't record either. So what happens? You have here the last data that maybe it was decelerating but still not key off and it was one kilometer per hour, and then it takes some time to start recording, and the next data that you have is five kilometers per hour. And in the middle, you have half an hour with no data in which the driver went to the bar to take a coffee. So if you put this in Excel or in any other calculation somewhere, you will get like a line here joining the points. Of course, the vehicle did not have this speed during this 30 minutes, and you should not calculate with this speed. This is a problem due to we are missing data on all this part. So if you this one is very clear, but others you have to zoom in and they are not so visible. But they really mess and yeah change the result of the calculation. So in this case, you also have to manually fix, manually put a zero speed here and a zero speed here and, and solve this. So this is very common. Okay, so I think these tips from the, from the speed are useful for you. I hope your system record good at the first uh, look, but it is very common to have this problem. So I think, I bet that it would be very likely that you have some of this. Okay, and now we go to the altitude errors. And it is more or less the same um, speak, it's a speech as a speed. Uh, the GPS records altitude, and the GPS was mostly designed to record latitude and longitude position, the, that, the technology. So, in altitude, has much bigger errors in theta direction than in x and y. So, even though you can say, ah, usually GPS is quite good, even though the GPS are quite good, it will be worse in altitude, always, because the technology is not so developed for, for that. So it, it provides altitude, but it does not have the same quality. And the problem is that they record altitude, but what we use is the angle of the slope. So that is also the derivative of the, of the altitude. And it is the same problem that we have with the speed. If we derivate a signal that it is not correct, what we have is a super noisy um, signal. So here, for example, you can see that if we directly take the data, it tells us that we are, uh, I don't know, sure. yeah, so it changes the slope constantly and very aggressive and, and, and that's not real. Usually slopes, you're not like this, you, are, you drive an up slope and then a down slope. So. Uh, uphill, then downhill, it, it is not so uh, noisy. So this also needs to be solved because if not, every time you have a downhill that it is not real, you are going to break and then accelerate and then break and then accelerate and this changes the energy consumption and we set up to 30%. So uh, Due to the lower quality of the GPS acquisition in altitude, things that can happen are signal loss. You are at 1,000 meters and then you are at zero meters for 10 seconds and then you are in 1,000 meters again. Okay, then steep steps. Sometimes the GPS falls 100 meters and then continues showing a nice trend, but 100 meters lower and then jumps again lower. So sometimes they have these offsets because this type of, of precision. So the shape is good, but you, you need to move it. Plus noise also is the problem and, and so on. So this needs to be processed until you get a smooth profile as for the speed. Okay. So one solution, is to process all this data, but 
sometimes the signals are so bad that you don't have with the tools we discussed before you cannot solve all the problems because this jump for example you don't know how to solve it if you don't have a reference so a good reference would be to cross check the altitude you record with the gps with a topographic database so what we do is to put the points in a map database that has a database of the slope and it provides the slope for each of the latitude and longitude point, points that you give. And this altitude, that it is much more smooth, can be compared with the one that was recorded second by second with the GPS and take one of those and make a, or make a merge or, or something. Okay. Uh, maybe the application that you choose is already doing this. Maybe it is quite developed and they don't give you straightforward the data of the GPS. They already do this matching with some of their algorithms and provide these results. So that would be good for you and let's work. Uh, but if you do this matching with maps, be careful because maps are not perfect either. And here we will see four difficulties of maps of using map databases. One is that map databases take the position in, in GPS and check on the map database what is the altitude to that position. But sometimes the latitude and longitude position is also bad. You, you get good speed because the speed is calculated with another algorithm in the GPS, but the position is also noisy. So the map will, for this point, will give you the elevation of this other point. So that is not real and may create jumps that are not truth and things like that. And this extreme noise mostly happens in, in cities because high buildings block the signal of the GPS and lower also the signal of the, of the GPS. So this is one problem, if that happens to you, maybe you should also manual fix or put it in the map. So work a little bit on this because you cannot, if you have this acquisition, you cannot give this acquisition strongly forward to the topographic database. Other problem of these databases is that they are topographic databases. Many times they are not road databases. So if you have a tunnel, they will give you the elevation over the tunnel not under the tunnel. So if you take this elevation, you will calculate if the vehicle was driving over the mountain and then the mountain back uh, downhill. So it's, it's impossible. So this would require manual fixing of all the tunnels if your route has tunnels. And another problem of this is that even the position is very accurate, Sometimes, and you know when you drive with your GPS, it deviates a little bit, maybe two meters, five meters error is almost nothing in the GPS and accepted by everyone. But if you are driving in a very mountain, uh, mountain um, road with cliffs, if instead of the GPS telling you are here, it tells you are three meters to the left here, and you check the altitude of this point in the database, it's below the, the cliff. So maybe it is 300 meters lower than the real point of the road. So also you should be careful with databases if you are driving in this type of roads and really verify that it is taking this point and not below the, the cliff. So that is why the best is to merge both GPS and the topographic databases. And maybe the app you choose is already making this because if they are apps dedicated to the mass market, no one likes to see things that make no sense. So probably they are already making some filtering or, or some corrections and, and maybe the, the data you receive has makes sense. So the purpose of all of this would be to have a cycle similar to this speed versus time and uh, distance versus time. This is, for example, from a real project of our refuse collecting vehicle. The high speed phases are 
from the depot to the where it puts the trash to the city and the small speed faces are a refuse collection inside the city and here we also you see we also have smooth slopes but not because the acquisition was smooth but because we were we had to work a lot to to smooth this this profile Okay, so it was a little bit long, but as the previous uh, section, uh, it is very important to have the correct inputs because if you don't have the correct inputs, it does not. If, even though you follow all the process correctly and apply the equations correctly, you will not obtain a, a good result. So the basis of all of this is to have good assumption and good inputs, and that's why we dedicated. So much, much, so much time to the data preparation of the of the cycle. Okay, and now we move to the next point, uh, in which we assume that we have a perfect cycle, and we calculate the uh, attractive power for for this cycle. Okay. okay. So this one, you benefit from the fact that the equations are almost the same from previous training. So we have the resistance forces that we also dedicated a lot of time in the previous training to estimate them in a, a realistic uh, manner. And then the force at the wheel that it is exactly the same as in the previous test. So um, the force it probably will be lower. Yesterday we will calculate in maximum performance cases that have either very high acceleration because they were acceleration cases or very high slope because they were very high slope cases. Now that we are dedicated to normal driving in the real use case, the accelerations and slope will be lower and most of the energy, as we saw also in the energy graph, will be dedicated to the resistance force. Okay. So uh, yes, you just take the formula that we or the, the speed profile that we saw before, and you apply the formula. So the resistance force is, is F0 plus F2 plus the square of the speed, plus then the mass per acceleration, and then mg sin uh, of the slope angle. Um, this calculation you can even do by Excel because they are there are many specific uh, calculation softwares and usually the benefit of using more complex softwares is when you do more complex simulations. For this calculation that it is quite a straightforward formula, they are not required. If you have those tools, you can use them, but this is not exactly required. When doing this calculation, please take into account that the mass that we have to count is not the mass of the empty vehicle, it's the mass that it is representative of the use case. So if the use case is to carry four people in the vehicle and 300 kilos of suitcases, that is your weight for the calculation. So Please, uh, most regulations are focused in curved weight with very low weight, but you want to size the vehicle for your use case, so consider the mass of your use case. Uh, second important point is how to calculate the acceleration. So we have to calculate it so that it, the acceleration of each instant represents the acceleration of the same instant, so it is centered. So to calculate it, we have to calculate it with the speed one time step forward minus the speed one time step before divided by the time one time step forward, the time one time step before. If not, the acceleration is not centered. It is a little bit shifted to the future or shifted to the past. And then all the calculations don't provide the adequate results. Indeed, we make tests and this not can, if you are working at one hertz, one data per second, not calculating the speed like that also provides 30% error. Or not calculating the acceleration like this also provides 30% error in the total energy estimation. So very important to calculate it like this and not maybe with the next time step and the current time step. Okay. And then other point, be very careful with the units of F2. When we see this type of calculations, 
I'm not lying. 50% of the problems and 50% of the errors is because the units of F2 were not correctly applied. And it is the most common and even for the most used uh, simulation persons, this, this may happen. So the problem with F2 is that the international units should be or would be uh, newtons, sorry, there should be a division here, newtons divided by meter square meter square divided by speed to the to the square so you, you see uh, force is newtons speed is meter per second so if you want to have newtons as an outcome um, the f2 should be newtons divided by meter second to the square so that would be in the international units. And I'm sorry because there is a division missing here, but you can imagine. But what happens is that in most test environment, so people that work on testing, not so much in simulation, and in all the regulations, because the regulations regulate the testing process. So in all these type of documents, F2 is presented as Newton divided by kilometers per hour to the square, so that you can directly multiply it by speed in kilometers per hour, and it is much easier to use. And also the problem is that all these documents give you the number and don't give you the units. You have to imagine, the, <laughs> imagine which are the units. So it, what is important is that if a uh, the, the the units that you use for F2, either meters per second or kilometers per hour, are the same that you use for speed. So if this one has kilometers hour, speed will be in kilometers hour. If this one has meter second, this speed will have meter second. If not, you are making a, a big error because the speed is elevated to the square. And it, over or underestimates 10 times, it is not negligible 10 times the, the F2, uh, the aerodynamic forces. Okay, so if you didn't take this into account and you were already doing the calculations for the sizing too, please take it into account. Okay, so after applying, applying the formula, uh, you will have a force uh, trace like this. And to prove that it can be performed in Excel, we work with many other tools, but to prove it, uh, here you have a sample of the data calculated in Excel. So we took the uh, first part of a double LTP cycle, that it is another regulation cycle, and we calculated the force that you should obtain by uh, putting some values that can be typical for a part of the cycle of mass, of rotational inertia, and of F's values. So this would be the result when applying that uh, values. You should do the same for your vehicle. Okay, and the next step is to calculate the power. That's very simple. F will now, the force at the wheel multiplied by the speed at that instant. So, with the same example that we had before, we obtain this power profile. Okay. And this would be the demand of instantaneous force or power at the wheel. We still have to get the demand at the battery. Okay. So, next, next step to calculate the demand of the battery is to decide which part of all this power is done by the motors and which part is done by the regenerative brakes. So all the traction will be done by the motors because there is no other traction source. But the, the braking, part of it will be made by regenerative brake and part of it by hydraulic brake. So let's uh, decide where to split it. And here, uh, I will dedicate one slide to let you know a little bit more of regenerative braking and different types of strategies. So let's focus first in the first graph, this one up here, in which we see the acceleration pedal. And if we are in the positive side, we, we will be pressing the acceleration. 
And if we are in the negative part, we will be pressing the brake pedal, okay? And this axis would be the torque. So yeah, from here to up, we have positive torque. What happens? Uh, electric vehicles, if you do nothing, if you don't do a specific calibration, the line would be here. So the acceleration pedal, when you do not press the acceleration pedal, you would have zero torque. So this would be the line. What happens? This feeling is not good for the driver. So this is the same feeling you would have as driving um, a combustion car in neutral. And it is very uncomfortable. It makes you feel unsafe, like you have low control over the vehicle. So what they do is to electronically apply some negative torque in the pedal, in the accelerator pedal. So electronically, they are letting you decelerate or break a little bit in the accelerator pedal. So the point where it changes uh, depends on the calibration of the vehicle, but in all of them, maybe at 10, 20% pedal. So above this value, you are providing positive torque, positive traction, but below this value, you are already braking a little bit, even you are pressing the accelerator. And that also happens with the combustion vehicles because so this weight gives you a, a similar feeling. And this torque that we are adding, so all this torque that we have is called the coast torque. So it would be the torque that you have the negative torque you would have when you are not pressing any pedal. No accelerator, no brake. This would be the, the cost torque. So all of this is already energy that we are regenerating. So when we are driving at very low accelerator pedals, we are already regenerating and giving energy back to the battery. And then when we press the brake, what happens? is that the hydraulic brake help us to brake. So part of the braking is performed by the motor, as here, that it is calibrated electronically. So part of it is performed by the motor, and this is energy that we save and we give back to the battery. And another part is performed by the hydraulic uh, brakes. And that part is lost in the form of heat, so it can no longer be used. So let's dive in a little bit more in different ways to calibrate the pedal, the braking pedal or the braking behavior. So there are some vehicles that have different uh, regeneration levels. So if you choose the low regeneration level, what will happen, this would be maybe an average regeneration level. So if you choose low regeneration, the curve of the torque you obtain at the different pedals would be this. And what it would happen is that you will feel the vehicle moving more freely, more similar to the feeling you have driving a, an IC vehicle, a combustion vehicle in, in, in neutral, and also lower rate regeneration. And then we have completely the opposite, the one pedal drive to put a very, very aggressive negative torque when you are at uh, this condition, at zero pedal and zero brake. And this, you have to get used to it because you really get a lot of deceleration when you are at zero percent pedal. So the first time it might feel uncomfortable, but the good part is that you can drive any, most of the day, or maybe you can drive one day in a row without touching the brake. So the purpose of this is to not touch the brake, to let people just modulate the speed with the accelerator without the need to touch the brake. The brake would be used only for emergency braking or something very extreme that you have to press it uh, fast for safety reasons. And this also permits to save more energy because all of this is performed by the by the motor and it is given back to the battery. 
And then I think uh, you might have heard about parallel break. So the technology of parallel break, so if you don't have this technology, what happens is when you start breaking the, pressing the brake, the motor does the same. Negative torque as it did at this point. So it continues doing the same and all the extra is done by the hydraulic braking. So if you have parallel brake, when you press the brake, the brake performed by the electric motor also increases a little bit more. So you regenerate a little bit more energy and you just lose this part of the, of the hydraulic brake. And then there is the series regenerative brake that it is another technology that in principle it is more efficient because what it does is when you start breaking everything is performed by the by the motor by the electric motor up to one point and that it is the maximum torque of the motor that anything more that you do is done by the hydraulic brake so the principle between this is that if you press the pedal very few maybe 10 percent 20 percent of braking pedal you are you are still doing everything with motor uh, brake, not with um, hydraulic brake, so you regenerate more. However, this technology has some difficulties to put it in the market. There are prototypes, but I think in the market there are not so many or no vehicles with this technology because it is more difficult also to warranty the safety if you have this because it takes time to the hydraulic to, to actuate and we should not forget that the purpose of the hydraulic and the brakes is to not have accidents. So that's the main purpose. And the secondary purpose is to save energy. So that's why we don't see this serious regenerative brake in practice in the market so much. And also because the trend is now doing one pedal drive style. So if you have a very aggressive braking in the deceleration in the accelerator pedal and you never or almost never press the brake, you are not losing energy for not having serious brake. So probably the, the trend is now going to this type of behaviors or letting the user choose between aggressive and non-aggressive uh, regeneration. Okay, so <laughs> a lot of information, but now we are going to calculate in our cycle how much does the hydraulic brake and the motor brake actuate. So, of course, here we can do a lot of simulations and different maps of brake calibration and so on, but uh, I give you the tip of how to do some simple or, or, or easy estimation. Um, usually, the, the, the brakes are calibrated so that when you are at 0% accelerator and 0% brake, you decelerate more or less as a constant uh, acceleration. acceleration. You feel something that it is quite constant over all the speed range. So it depends on how you design it. It can be uh, minus one meters per square second deceleration or minus 1.5 or even minus two but the value that you choose for that braking mode is applied to all this almost all the speed range so for our calculations what we can do is to estimate one value from normal numbers would be between one and 1.5 meters per square second that would be what it is performed by the motor brake and all the accelerations that are beyond this number would uh, be performed by the hydraulic brake. So we would be working or simulating this case in which here at this point we set it to be minus one meters per square second or minus 1.5 and everything that exceeds, exceeds this point is energy that we lose. So uh, to calculate with this is very simple. You just have to recalculate the force that we calculated some slides ago. 
but limit the acceleration you use on the formula to the value that you choose, minus 1, minus 1.5. And then from this new force, calculate the power. And if you compare, you will see that they are different. Here, in our example, we put minus 0 0.75. Why? Because we are in a regulation cycle that the maximum uh, deceleration is minus 1.5. So if we put this number to 1.5, you would not see the difference. And we wanted you to see the difference. So we put it at a very low value, three, minus 0 0.75. And you can see here the difference. So everything between the orange and the blue is energy that we are losing because it is being break by the um, hydraulic brake. Uh, you can set different values. And usually, if you take real user cycles and not regulation cycles, as we are using in this example, there are more aggressive acceleration. So it is normal to find accelerations up to minus two, minus three meters per square second. So all of those would be accelerations that you would partially miss if you use this uh, deceleration level. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Uh, um, why these deceleration levels are normal levels? Because usually vehicles are quite optimized to the situations that occur in the homologation cycles. So if homologation cycles don't usually go beyond minus 1.5, the regenerative break goes to that value. And this way, we don't lose energy in the regulation cycle. So you see here, we did it with minus 7, 0.75. And we did not use so much energy, even with this value. Okay. In real driving, I think the difference, if you take real routes, will be, will be higher. OK, so we already have this curve. This curve, the yellow one, is the one that has to be provided by the motor. So this is still power at the wheel, but this is the part of the power at the wheel that it is provided by the motor. And now we move from power at the wheel to electric power. And for that, we have to consider the motor and transmission and inverter, efficiency, efficiency. And what happens is that the efficiency of these uh, technologies is not constant. It, is, it has a map, like probably you're used to see this type of maps. And this is a whatever uh, each motor has its own map, but it is quite representative, quite similar to this. And what happens when you see this map? Is that oh, this motor is so good; it's, it has 94% efficiency. I like it. Yes, this motor has a point or an area that has 94% efficiency, but when you drive you are not driving at this point. You are mostly driving here. And here, the efficiency is much lower, 82 or lower, because it is not plotted here. And why it is so sl sl small, the efficiency here? It is because mm, the drugs. So the machines convert electric energy in in mechanical energy, and that has some efficiency, but they also have some drugs, some frictions. And the friction is the same, no matter you are working at 100 Newton meter or at 600 Newton meter. So, if, for example, if you have 4 Newton meter friction, when you are working at 50 Newton meter here, this friction lowers the total efficiency by 4 divided by 58%, so a lot. But if you are working here, this same friction, that is 4 newton meter divided by 400, is 1%. It lowers the, the efficiency very few. So the lower you are, the more part 
of the penalty of the friction that you get. And that's why always, always in every machine that rotates and it's mechanical, uh, transmissions, combustion engine, electric engine, everything that rotates, deficiencies at low uh, torque are, are smaller because almost you are just paying or you are just using all your energy to overcome the frictions. Okay, so here, so that you can believe me, <laughs> uh, we have at the right uh, an electric vehicle, a passenger car, with their maximum torque, curves, minimum torque, and these are efficiency ISO lines, 0 0.75, 0 0.8, and you see that there is an optimal area. And you see here colored where it really works in the use cycle. So you can say, okay, this area is so good, I really like it. But what happens is that in the real driving, you work here that you have low efficiency, and you also work here where you have low efficiency. So usually, and it is a pity, but the points where you work do not match <laughs> the point that we already like, that it is this one that has very low efficiency. So you can expect the, your vehicle to mostly work in this area, in the, in the user cycles. And what is the high area for? The high area, you only touch it when you are driving at the maximum slow or full pedal acceleration. So mostly on perfor high performance driving or very aggressive driving. But in the normal situations, you, the, the area that you touch mostly is this and this has low efficiency. Um, the, best way to do it would be to have a simulation software. So here I show you more or less the, the flow of calculation. So you will have all the input parameters, the maps of the components with their efficiency, and the simulation software calculates each second where the motor is working, whether it is working here or here or here, and each second calculates the efficiency to achieve the, the total energy, the, the instantaneous electric energy. So if you have a tool like that in MATLAB or AVL, Siemens, GT, there are so many different tools, you can really calculate the, 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 with the efficiency map of, of, your, of your component and achieve the second by second efficiency. But if you don't have this capability, you can still calculate with Excel and consider an average efficiency for the, all the components together, transmission plus motor plus inverter. And I would say that if you are using, if you have the, the map of the supplier, you can look at it or even plot here where the motor is going to work and mentally or doing the average of the efficiency. Right. Otherwise, you can also consider these figures. If you have a very specific motor that it is specifically developed for automotive use, so it has this characteristic, X higher than one, and you, you, you know it was dedicated and optimized for efficiency, you can consider between 70 and 80% average efficiency, also including inverted and transmission, and if your motor is not optimized or is not specific for automotives, it, it can be even for another application and it is used for automotive, it will not have the same efficiency when working at these variable efficiency points or variable operative points. So in these cases, you can consider 60-70% average efficiency. The best is that you check with your specific motor, but in case you don't have this data, I think it can be a useful tip. Okay, so now we know the efficiency, at least the average efficiency, and we have to move from what we need in the wheel to what we need in the battery. So when due to components efficiency, every energy or every power that flows through different components, when 
it loses energy in the in the path. Okay, so when you are in traction, the battery has to provide more electric energy than what reaches the wheel because it loses energy in all the intermediate steps and in the other way. When you are regenerating, the power that you have on the wheel will make it its way back to the battery. So in all the steps it has to follow, it loses a little bit of energy. So that's why we will have this equation. So in traction, the electric energy you need is the power at will divided by the efficiencies of all the components that you can estimate an overall number. So the, the overall numbers for all of them together are the ones of the previous slide. But we divide it because the power that the battery has to provide has to be bigger than what we have in the wheel. We are losing energy in the path. And in the other way, the energy that reaches the battery when we are regeneration is the power that we have at will multiplied by the efficiency of the intermediate components because we lose a little bit in every component. So finally, the formula would be like this. So when the power at will is higher than zero, we are at traction, we divide by the average efficiency and when we are in regeneration, we multiply. We have to make different calculations depending on where we are in traction or in general regeneration. Okay. Oh, sorry. And we don't have the graph here. Yeah, but you would obtain a graph that compares the, the electric the electric traction with the with the mechanical traction. In traction, it would be higher, and in regeneration, it would be smaller. Okay, so then we get to the last point, that it is the battery capacity. And to set the battery capacity, we already calculated the electric energy, uh, for the um, for the different contributors for for the traction, and now we have to consider also the electric energy we need to the other consumers, the lighting, the comfort, the HMI, all all the other uh, consumers, uh, the displays. The, if you have cargo that needs to be refrigerated, so to refrigerate that cargo, and special devices, for example, refuse collection, they have the the elevator and the different devices that consume energy, if you, uh, autonomous vehicle, the, um, the devices, the, the, the chips that calculate the analog sensors consume a lot of energy, so you also have to consider. So this for your specific use case, okay? Um, so you have to estimate it and maybe you can estimate it uh, checking the consumption in watts or in kilowatts of all the electronic consumers that your vehicle has and you also have to consider whether they will be on or off during your ride so maybe if the refrigeration is not always on or you have to decide also whether you expect them to be on or not uh, if you don't have these figures, uh, we give you here some hints of value you can use. So 250 watts, if only the electronic units are present in your, in your vehicles, or maybe just the uh, control unit to control the motors, the inverters, and the different devices. So just to feed this control unit. Uh, 500 watts, if your vehicle also has this small display screens, some light in the bottoms of the dashboards, okay, and up to five, uh, 700, 500 watts, if you also consider that they will be using the ratio, that the display screen is very heavy, that they will be using the lights, and higher than one kilowatt, if you are using comfort or other special 
consumers. And we don't, we cannot tell the number here because it can be from one kilowatt to 15 kilowatt. It really depends on the on your case. So if, if this is the case for you, I really encourage you to check the specifications of your big consumers. Decide also to which power level they will be working because maybe they are not at full power all the time and, and estimate it. Otherwise, if you don't have big consumers, maybe these uh, values can be useful for you to estimate. Okay. So we have the electric traction demand that is the green. We have the consumer's demand that it is the yellow. Here we estimated at 500 watts. And if we zoom the both of us, we have what we expect the battery to give the power out of the battery. That's the, the blue in, in our example. So to calculate the energy for the battery, you just integrate all of this. Oh, sorry, this is not 3,500, it's 3,600. We will correct it in the, in the last person. Okay, so you just integrate all the energy of the battery or sum the energy of the battery per the time and divide it by 3,600 seconds. That's the time that the seconds that one hour has. And this way you get the total kilowatt hours that your vehicle demands for that cycle. So for example, in our example, it was 0 0.24 kilowatt hour for that cycle. That was quite small for 150 seconds. Then you also integrate the distance, calculate the distance. That's the integrative of the speed and you get the kilometers, 2.86 kilometers for our example. And then the kilometric consumption, just the division of the two of them. Obtain 83.4 watt hour per kilometer. And this is, I think, a, a quite normal value that you can expect for for quarry cycles. So for the other vehicles, it should be lower. And for passenger cars, uh, buses, uh, higher. But for quarry cycles, this is quite aligned to which you can expect. So to comply with your target range, imagine that you have a range of 100 kilometers, you have to multiply this range by this consumption. So in this case, if we wanted uh, to have a range of 100 uh, kilometers, we would consume 8.3 kilowatt hours from the battery. It is a single multiplication. So that is your demand to the battery. But that is not enough. You cannot size the battery to that number. You have to have also some safety factors. And why? First, because the battery loses energy in the internal resistance. The internal resistance depends on a lot of factors, the architecture of the battery, the technology, the temperature, the SOC, whether it's charge, recharge, a lot of factors. But uh, for the sizing purpose, instead of calculating specifically these losses, you can estimate that 5% of the energy, usually it is less, it is two or three, but you can calculate that up to 5% of the energy can be lost in, in, in these internal resistances of the battery. So you have to increase that energy by half percent. And then there is other reasons to increase the energy that you have to store in the battery. First is that when charging, you usually do not reach the 100% charge. You get the 99, 98.5. So you cannot use the 100% of the vehicle, yeah, of the battery. You can use most of it, but not 100. So you lose a little bit because you don't uh, recharge to 100. And also you lose, a, lose a, lot of, a little other bit because you don't deplete to zero. Because if you deplete to zero, it strongly damages the battery and reduces its life. So it usually they deplete to 10. In the dashboard, dashboard for the driver, they report zero maybe, but they really are depleting to, to 10 more or less. 
And also, when the vehicle communicates that there is no energy remaining, that it is at zero, even though it is at 10, uh, and you say to the driver, there is no more energy, you have to stop. The vehicle still has to have some remaining energy to let the driver at least do a safety stop, because imagine you are driving at 120 kilometers and the vehicle says, you run out of energy, you have to stop, and everything stops at that moment, you may have an accident. So there is always a remaining energy that at least permits you to make a safe stop. And the other reason is that when the vehicle ages, the capacity of the vehicle reduces. And usually a battery is considered to be changed when it reaches 80% of its capacity. So it means that when it is at 80% of its capacity, we should still be useful to comply with the use case because if we cannot replace it, but we cannot use it either because it does not have enough range, we cannot use the vehicle for our purpose. So if you really want to guarantee that your purpose can be fulfilled when the battery is almost to be changed, at 80% of its capacity, you have to increase the initial capacity and have more at the beginning to warranty that when its capacity reduces, you can, you can at least fulfill your use case. So all these factors, at least you should consider to increase your capacity by 15 or 20% more than what we calculated. Okay. So the energy unit for the battery is the energy that we will actually use for our use cycle, multiplied by the 5% more or less of the resistance, um, plus the margin of 15-20% more of the other safety cases. And that's the energy that you need. Uh, here I uh, show you again this library. Uh, this is, does not have anything to do with the other, but I think it's a wood web with a lot of information of energy, volumes, weights, powers of different cells. So I, I think it is useful to, to help you making decisions. And I want to point out that once you calculate, it may happen that the battery that you calculate, then you realize that the weight of this battery or the volume of this battery is too big because we made the wish list of the targets, the wish list of the range, we were very restrictive on the motor efficiency, very safe in the margin, so if you're very safe with that, maybe you oversize the battery and then you come out with a battery that is too big to fit in the space that you have in the prototype. So that it is another constraint that needs to be looked for. So at this moment, I encourage you, once you have the battery um, capacity, to also check with some different cell technologies what would be the weight and the volume of such capacity, and check whether there is enough volume in your vehicle to integrate that battery, and also, if the battery is so heavy that the weight of your vehicle will increase more than you expected. So if the final weight of the vehicle is more than you expected because the battery is very heavy, you have to redo all the calculations again. And the calculations done again will result in a higher and even higher weight battery, a little bit higher weight battery. So if your weight estimation was far from the result, you really need to recalculate with that new weight of the battery. Everything, the Fs, the F0, F2, the power requirement, the energy requirements, and, and so on. Okay, so to this, uh, we finish the, the training. And in the next slide, I will give you some ideas on how you can validate your calculation, because again, uh, if you have a wish list, it's easy to overestimate the targets that you really need and be deviated from what the, the market is doing. So it is good to correlate with the market and 
with different tools because this will help you to identify if you made some mistake in the equations, if you were maybe too optimistic or too, too pessimistic, estimated some parameters, or if your use case is different and it is correct that you have different results. But so, <laughs> as in previous uh, training, we really encourage you to, to check with the market, with your competitors, uh, what battery capacity they sized, and, and to compare it and check if you think it is reasonable uh, your result with the results that they are claiming. Other way to validate your results would be to do an additional fit in your Excel sheet and calculate for the same case that we are calculating. We took the first 450 seconds of the WLTP and we used uh, these parameters. So if you use these same parameters, you should obtain the, the same result. So this would be another way to check that the formulas are correct. Not that the assumptions are correct because you're, maybe some of you are developing scooters or, or bikes. So if you put these numbers, you will obtain the same result, but you don't know whether your numbers, assumptions are, are correct. And then another way is that very long ago, this was two. 2014, uh, we, in a European project, we developed a free online tool to estimate, it was most focused for design, it was to estimate the weight and the volume of the batteries and to check if they could be integrated in the vehicle. And this is very simple, so I would not take the result of this tool to your sizing but this can be useful for correlation so to put the same numbers in the tool as in your excel and to validate that you're obtaining the same numbers the numbers so the tool is uh, free available on online and it is quite limited due to the calculations that could be hosted on the website at that time that was 2014 and it was also done with the state of the art and the regulations and everything of 2014, that are not the ones of today. Uh, but anyway, I think this would be a way to, to correlate for, for other cases. So when doing that, consider that the tool is using this cycle to calculate that the NEDC cycle, that's the one that was in the regulation at that time, 2014, and that if the vehicle cannot reach 120 kilometers per hour, what it does, it, it just cuts, it just limits the speed and puts a constant speed at which the, at the speed that we say. So the results, the numbers, you can check if you have the same numbers, but you cannot take that numeric watt hour per kilometer consumption and apply it to your use case because you no one will drive like this. And so this is with no acceleration is not representative of the real use of the vehicle. So you can just use it to validate the the num the, the numerics, the of your results. Okay, also select here the option of maximum weight and also for the tire labeling that we saw yesterday, consider that this tire labeling refers to the former regulation. And, the, and here is the chart of the former regulation that it is different of the one that we shared yesterday. Indeed, you can see here in, the, in this project, the 2020 was the far away future, and now for us it is the it is the past. But still, it is a tool for validate. And you may think it's a waste of time to validate, but it is also something that we always do 
the quality department indeed in every company makes every calculation to be double checked by another means and we also double check with the market and double check with with different tools uh, so for example here is a tool that we internally use to double check that it is also a simple tool with similar calculations to the ones that you, uh, I show you today. I don't have much time to explain, <laughs> but it depicts the vehicle weight and the battery volume that you will need. So it is also a very useful tool to calculate with the people from design and from packaging. And we put in the tool all the targets and the tool plots areas that are impossible so let's say the light blue are range targets so if you have whatever range target and this vehicle weight it is impossible to comply it with a battery of less than eight less than eight uh, less than 80 liters so maybe the design department wants to publish a very high range and 20 liters battery <laughs> you can say no it is not possible either you have to increase the volume or you have to reduce the to reduce the the range so this is a very simple calculation we do the complex simulation models but we double check the result with the result of this uh, tool because even though the equations are simple there are so many equations so many assumptions units cycle per processing there are many things that can induce errors that it is always good to double check with an alternative uh, tool and here just for you to have a fast look there is a view of the tool and the nice part of that is that it has different type of cars and you also see the constraints moving as you move the efficiency of the motor, the, the energy density of the battery, as if you move the target. So it is quite interactive. And by now I just have this video, but I have the tool. So maybe if you are interested to open the tool and play a little bit around how different factors affect the results. So here you see that we put a range target that it is very difficult to get. So if you want to play around a little bit with these values and check the sensitivity and how different parameters affect the results, we can do it in the follow-up session. So I, I suggest you to send it in the question list or by email, and we will consider also opening this tool live during the next session. Okay, and that's all for now. Here are all the references of the links that we have and some papers that we published that were used for this training. And as in the other case, we really encourage you to follow these points and apply them to your case to calculate uh, all these demands at the Excel and to validate your results with different options of calculations. So thank you very much for your time. I'm really sorry again that we used all the all the time, but I, 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 as you saw, there is a lot of information to process. Maybe not so many equations, but a lot of a lot of tips to be able to put the right data into the equations, and that's why we took a little bit long. If you want us to answer some questions now or if not if it's too late for you mostly for the asian uh, startups we can take your questions and answer them in the follow-up session next week Okay, I just check a question for the audience that the audience is asking for the tools that we use to calculate. Um, in general, our, our 
company, it is uh, dedicated to, um, to perform this type of project ourselves. So our typical business or the business of my group is to work together with a company that wants to perform these calculations and we perform these calculations ourselves or together, sharing part of the work in a collaborative manner, but uh, we don't share the, the software. So either we have some calculation tools developed by us, that we have them, but the, the, we don't sell them, or we use commercial softwares for which we also purchase a, a license. So here, the only software that we can share is the Elva tool that when we send you the, the email, you can log in to this uh, tool link. But as I said, it is quite limited. The speed profile will not be so realistic for quadricycles and it's with the regulations because it was done in uh, 2014. So the, the way of having more direct support from us would be that you calculate uh, all these steps. Uh, everything that we did today can be calculated uh, with, the, with the equations that we show today can be calculated with an Excel sheet. So you can calculate it with an Excel sheet if you don't have the tools. And also, if you present it in the follow-up meeting next week, present your case, you will have the opportunity to have direct feedback from us. So even though you did not reach to the end, we can help you to finish the, the calculations. So uh, that's the, the two options because the, the tools are, are not available and this is exactly the type of business that we provide. Otherwise, you, we can also discuss of having a a separate project in, in which we share more tools or so on, but we cannot send other tools, just this one, within the, within the project. Also at the end of today, uh, probably of today and if not uh, Monday morning, we will share the three presentations and the template for the handout work. I don't know if there is any more questions. I don't think so. Okay, so Juan, do you just want to say something else to close the session? Okay. Okay, so then we would close the session now. Thank you all of you for the, the time you dedicated for this meeting. I really hope uh, you, you liked it and it is useful for you. As I mentioned, uh, our main activity is not to make trainings, it's to perform this type of projects hand by hand with the clients and we perform some of the biggest part of the calculations and, and of the projects. So we had to um, prepare this material specifically for, for this training and to give you this, this, this knowledge. So we did it with a lot of passion. We really wanted to transmit you the, the knowledge so that you can do it on, on, your, on your own. So and so, yeah. So as we dedicated so much effort to it, I, we really hope it was useful for you, and we really hope to have active participation, participation of the startups with presentations of their calculations or, or even doubts in the in the follow up meeting. Okay. So thank you very much, and see you next week at uh, Wednesday, same time as this meeting. You will receive the, the, the link to join to the meeting uh, soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.